coming hot off the heels of their massively successful remake of RE2, Capcom has decided to bless us all with yet another stab at bringing back our collective childhoods, which is a little bittersweet. See, Resident Evil 3 was a polarizing entry in the series for me. On one hand, the survival horror gameplay was some of the most well-refined and well-executed the series had ever seen, but on the other, it seemed like a lot was being asked of me as far as the action focus went, and given the tank controls and perspective, I just always felt like I lacked the tools to rise to the occasion. In my opinion, RE3 was hurting for this kind of a modern reassessment much more than Part 2 was, but of course that's all contingent on this remake actually being good. So is Capcom going to finally mend the rift I've always had with about 20% of RE3's core gameplay? Can they force lightning to strike the same place twice and bang out yet another critically acclaimed AAA remake? What's up guys, I'm Jared from Avalanche Reviews, welcome to the Resident Evil Retrospective. Capcom dropped RE2's remake on the world a little over a year ago, and while I do love a fast turnaround for games I'm looking forward to, this was an insanely short amount of time to wait for a major AAA release. And there are a few different answers to why that is, but the most interesting is the fact that development for RE3 started alongside RE2. And even more crazy is the fact that these two remakes were rumored to have once been one single package. Which thinking back on it explains why we went so long without any news regarding RE2. I remember thinking the remake was just vaporware, but it turns out they missed their deadlines not due to mismanagement or anything, but because they are working on two games at once. Which is a little more of an understandable predicament, honestly. Now there might be some of you who are crying foul at the idea of having to pay twice for what was supposed to be a single package, but I think there are some upsides here. Most importantly being this allowed the developers to go in and tweak 3 based on what I think was unanimously fair criticism of the second remake. and. Don't you worry, I will be getting into that a bit more when we cover the gameplay, but you know how things go around here. Before we talk about how the game plays, we gotta talk about what kind of story it's trying to tell, and there's a fair amount to talk about in that department. How did this all happen so fast? I don't know. One fucked up thing always leads to another. Resident Evil 3's original release did something with its story that fans nearly universally praised, and that was give a little more screen time to everyone's favorite master of unlocking, Jill Valentine. It was like an opportunity to catch up with an old friend, and allowed for more of an arc to Jill's character, so if there was one thing Capcom would have to get right with this remake, it would most certainly be Jill. And in my opinion, they definitely accomplished that, to varying degrees of success. But of course the devs were operating under a bit of a handicap, See, those of us who had been down with the series since the beginning had the advantage of seeing Jill harden in the flames of near-death experiences and corporate pharmaceutical grade corruption. We saw her go from naive and ignorant in the first game to one of the few people who actually saw what was going on in the third. There was a lot of context to absorb there going from one game to the other, but Remake doesn't have that luxury. This is essentially the first time we're meeting this version of Jill. We can't exactly use the previous games in the series as a reference point since Capcom's been making changes to core events and characters in the RE universe with the hopes of modernizing it. And while I do very much like the direction they're taking the series in, it feels odd to have this be our first introduction to the new and improved Jill Valentine. That being said, I really do like Jill here. She has a rugged survive at all cost demeanor and is given a lot of opportunities to show off how she feels about the events taking place around her. I assume we're all pretty familiar with the events of RE3 by now, but just in case you're totally new to the series, Jill and her special tactics and rescue squad ended up uncovering the illegal activities conducted by the pharmaceutical company Umbrella while narrowly escaping from one of their failed viral research facilities in the mountains of Raccoon City. Returning to their superiors with no actual evidence of their wild claims, the group quickly found out that Umbrella's reach extends far beyond what they originally imagined, and that's when the game starts. Jill and her team came back to the city looking to warn people of Umbrella's human testing and the incredibly lethal T-virus, but Instead, they get lambasted by the media, the public, and their peers at the RCPD. The game starts with some really cool Dawn of the Dead remake style live action footage meant to represent what's been happening in Raccoon City of late. It seems like some kind of viral strain has broken out and there's panic in the streets, aka the perfect zombie movie setup. We awaken Jill's shoes and see that she's still haunted by what she's been through and right off the bat, I really like this piece of her backstory. I mean, I imagine if I had just escaped from a creepy mansion and secret underground research facility, both crawling with people infected by a virus, 
Well, I'd probably worry I was infected too. Waking up from her zombified nightmare, Jill gets a call from the only remaining Stars member in the city, Brad, who lets her know that she needs to get the hell out of Dodge. So she does, or at least she tries to. And not even 10 minutes into the game, we get our reveal of this remake's rendition of Nemesis, one who apparently has no issue kicking a downed woman in the ribs. After a pretty damn harrowing escape scene, we meet up with Brad and get to see the hell that Raccoon City has turned into post-infection. There are cars crashing into stores, people dying left and right, and an army of living corpses spilling out from every direction you can look. Which, to be honest, is exactly what I've always wanted from an RE game. Being a huge fan of zombie movies, I've always loved the parts where they just show the effects of this kind of infestation and all the chaos it would cause. Which RE3 did a perfect job of translating to a video game. No joke, there was one part in the intro where I just kind of stopped and listened to all the noise coming from people screaming and gunshots going off in the distance. It's oddly soothing in a psychopathic kind of way. Now, I know a lot of people have issue with Nemesis showing up so early in the game, but I think it works here. In the original, Brad has a chance to foreshadow Nem's existence, and we get to see just how lethal he is when he gets a hold of his target, but I would say Remake does a good job of recreating that feeling. Except this time, laser focused in on Jill. See, he's clearly looking to kill her, and he's not afraid to rip concrete out of a damn building to get the job done, so I feel like they're giving the same message. It does sort of feel like Capcom blew its load a little too early, but if you ask me, this Nemesis reveal was just as effective as the original, just in a different kind of way. Plus, it definitely follows the approach given to remakes in the RE series so far. The same story beats are typically covered, but the devs often toy with your expectations by changing their timing a bit. Kind of like the Liquors introduction in 2's remake, or the dogs faking you out in part 1. Continuing on, I am going to be spoiling some of the story here, so click that link in the description or skip to the timestamp on screen and we'll catch up with you guys in a bit, alright? So further down the road, Jill and Brad are jumped by zombies and after getting bit, Brad opts to stay behind, giving Jill just enough time to escape the building. Was it less epic or impactful than the original? Well, in my opinion, yes, but it does serve two purposes, I think. Not only does it offer a bit of a redemption arc for a guy who has historically been, and I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say this, a big ol' scaredy cat, but it also leads to one of the most powerful scenes in any Resident Evil game, hell, maybe any video game I've ever seen. Come on, man. Not you too. Sorry. Sorry. I'm not really sure why, but this scene right here really got to me. Something about Marvin's face dropping like that as a zombified colleague mumbles out a word, giving him just a microsecond to second guess his actions. I don't know, it just messed me up. Back to Brad's sacrifice, I wish there would have been a little more fanfare or at least something resembling that big of a loss in Jill's dialogue, but I did get the idea behind it, so it might not have been exactly what I wanted, but I think it works really well. Jill, aiming to make the most of this new situation, heads to a parking garage where survivors are being airlifted out of the city, but this asshole ain't about to let that happen. So Jill does the only sensible thing available, by literally crashing a car into Nemesis, throwing them both off a building. And this is where we get to meet Carlos. a member of Umbrella's own in-house mercenary force who's been sent in to quote-unquote save the people of Raccoon City. Now, Jill is obviously a little biased when it comes to the whole Umbrella situation, but Carlos did just save her life, and the remnants of his platoon are the only ones with a riot out of the city, so she decides to work with them in getting the subway system running. And oddly enough, that's about all of the story you really need. Of course, there are many more stops along the way, but the main drive of this plot is Jill escaping the city and avoiding Nemesis at all costs. A very simple but effective method for this kind of story, if you ask me. More than anything, this plot is driven less by a main narrative and more by its characters. Jill starts off cold and almost callous, but we get to see these brief glimpses of emotional overload. How is this fucker not dead yet? Then towards the end, we get to see her open up and actually start trusting the people around her. She starts off her little relationship with Carlos by being sarcastic and shooting him down at every turn. Not your partner. But as the game progresses, she starts to respect him. Nikolai, who was very cold and robotic in the original game, seems to take much more pleasure in being an asshole here. Nikolai, what are you doing? It's not after you. <laughs> He's still a total piece of shit, but now he gets a kick out of it. 
I think this makes for a much more believable antagonist and it's way easier to hate him. And if there was one contribution this game has made to the international community, it is without a doubt the fact that they somehow made Carlos into the most lovable character in the game. It's all right, you're going ahead. I'm not gonna die on you, I'll leave you in a cold, cruel, Carlosless world. Okay. No joke, he's a perfect 10 this time around. He's still got that gung ho hero mentality, and yeah, he's definitely still a horn dog, but those aspects of his personality have been dialed back to what I would call socially acceptable levels. In fact, voice acting across the board is off the charts in delivery and execution. The only real gripe I had was Nikolai's voiceover being noticeably lower than everyone else's. It's done. Give me the vaccine, you greedy son of a bitch. No, 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 no. You need money. I like money. There were times when I had no idea what he was saying because the background music was drowning him out, which seems really odd because everybody else was integrated perfectly into the game. Of course, his vocal performance is still incredible, it's just very, very low, which I don't understand. But I guess there could be worse problems with a voiceover. Luckily, we got a cast that was very talented, and speaking of which, I was able to sit down and talk with Jeff Shine, the voice of the new and improved Carlos, and pick his brain about the part he played in his transformation. I'm fine. Personal space. Okay, I get it. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, I did all the, so the, all the body work, uh, all the facial movements, uh, and obviously the voice, so that's all me. I actually, I, I didn't know, um, I didn't know Carlos as a character prior to, to the game. So having, having knowledge of, like, previous incarnations of something can be both advantageous and, and a disadvantage. For me, in this particular sense, I think it was an advantage because I didn't want to have anything in mind. I knew this game was going in a, in a slightly different direction. I knew Capcom had a clear vision, and, and I knew the way that I wanted to, you know, play the guy. So, in this particular case, I don't think it, it would have been helpful for me to, like, have a reference point. Um, I think it was better for me to just kind of, like, start from scratch, you know, knowing full well, like, you know, that I would either... You know, I would, I would, I was comfortable at that point knowing that I would either, you know, live or die on those choices. You know, there was a lot of Carlos was on the page because we wanted to strike that balance. At least in my mind, was to strike that balance between someone who's highly capable, you know, can can handle any situation, and you feel confident in his abilities, but you also feel comfortable around him, and he's kind of he brings a little bit of levity you know again a lot of it was on the page it certainly came that way and then i think you know once i started once we were on set um and we were all sort of observing the way the character was moving i think we all just naturally really pushed in that direction so i mean yeah i mean i would say to some extent some of that was was you know things that i brought to it as well i don't know that i'll ever my, my entrance into a game will ever be as cool as a rocket launcher on the hood of a car saying, hey, fuckface. Hey, fuck yeah, yeah, I'm actually a huge gamer. Um, I play, <laughs> I play more than my wife would like, I think. Uh, I, I do a little bit of both, to be honest with you. I mean, right now, I think like, you know, with, I have a, a little bit of a limited time, but, um, so a lot of what I'm playing currently is like a lot of new releases and stuff like that, but um, I love the old stuff. Voice acting is, you know, is much less about the voice itself. You need to have something underneath it too, right? Like there has to be the, the acting component, the character component as well. Otherwise a cool voice gets old really fast. Yeah, I'd be happy to. If that, if that opportunity ever came around, I'd be happy to. It's a great franchise. I mean, I love the franchise and I love Capcom and um, I think it's a great group of people. So yeah, that's an easy, that's a no-brainer. Don't worry, I'm not gonna go and leave you in a cold, cruel, Carlosless world. Giant, infinitely large thanks to Jeff for spending a bit of time talking with me. That was really damn cool of him. But heading back to the story, I'm gonna go against the grain here and say this is my preferred RE3 narrative. It still has that charm that the original brought to the series, but it feels perfectly in line with the more dark and realistic direction Capcom has been taking things. 
Plus it has these great ties to the second game that really pulls things into this really cool singular narrative. The world they built here feels like a big step up from how sectioned off Raccoon City felt in 2's remake, and it seems like everyone, including Jill, has had elements of their character tweaked, and the result is a cast of characters that are much more likable and real feeling than in the previous game, which is really saying something. Honestly, there were more than a few times in my first playthrough where I was just touched by how emotional the scene was, and that's a really hard trick to pull off on me, so I appreciate the hell out of it. I also think they went the extra mile by including some absolutely killer world building in the form of files that can be found. Just like in the originals, these little tales push the overall feel of the story into more fleshed out waters. Of course, it would be insane of me not to mention the absolutely jaw-dropping facial animations here. I will get more into the technical side of things a little later, but good god do these faces carry the entire experience. The emotion of each scene is very clear to see, and these facial expressions honestly sold me on the game's story. They were much more expressive than those found in RE2, and I don't really know if that's because of better tech, better actors, or both, but either way, I was massively impressed. And I think massively impressed is exactly how I feel about this story overall. It was a short experience to be sure, but it was also a much tighter structure than the previous remake. It felt like there was never any downtime, and whenever I would start to get tired of my current location, the game would jump in with a storyline cutscene or some kind of environmental change that would have things feeling fresh again. Just like 2's remake, 3's story was incredibly fun for me to experience, and thanks to some amazing acting both physically and vocally, what's here comes across in a very earnest way. The original RE3 may not have given the developers a whole lot to work with as far as the narrative goes, but they really pulled off something awesome here, and managed to bring back that old Resident Evil feeling. And as such, the story gets two big thumbs up from me. Oh, and just in case anyone from Capcom may be listening, hi, thanks for tuning in, and would you please, for the love of God, stop teasing me and give me a satisfying conclusion to the Robert Kendo story, please. Thank you. Double! Shit, Jill. Kendo, you're all right. You're all, all right to stretch. And here's where we get into the interesting stuff. As someone who has completely stayed away from any trailers, leaked info, or demos for RE3, I didn't really get a feel for how people were liking it. And now that I finally finished it, I'm hearing a lot of negatives. And to be honest, I have my own, but before we get into that, what exactly are we working with here? Which luckily is a relatively simple question to answer. Take the gameplay of RE2's remake and apply it here. It's still reminiscent of that original survival horror gameplay to a staggering degree, and it's still incredibly impressive if you ask me. The ammo conservation, limited inventory, atmosphere-driven scares, the zombies and BOWs, they're all here, and they have no business being translated this well into a more modern gaming framework. At first, you're given a small chunk of Raccoon City to explore, and I was beyond pleased to run around in this city turned upside down by the dead. The original version of 3 always felt so cool to me because I finally got to explore that area that had always seemed to exist just outside the events in Part 2, and the remake is no different. Traveling through the rundown streets and using alleyways to crisscross this little chunk of Armageddon was an absolute delight. And the other areas of the game are both fun to explore and don't overstay their welcome. Plus, I really like the extended hospital scene. That was really cool. And I'm going to draw a little bit of a line in the sand here because every other reviewer seems to be really upset that there's this holding back a zombie horde section at the end of the hospital, but this didn't really bother me too much. It was actually kind of fun. I'm not really sure why I'm seeing it so different from everybody else, but hey, I guess different strokes for different folks. Item fetching and backtracking are still as satisfying as they've ever been in a survival horror game, and the environments do an amazing job of multiplying that satisfaction. Thankfully, puzzles have also made a return, but sadly, they're even less present than in the last remake. This was a little disappointing for me, honestly, but I doubt very much your average owner of a current-gen console is demanding more puzzles in their games, so I'm probably in the minority there. And, well, I guess I've danced around it long enough. Yes, there is massive amounts of content missing from this remake if we're using the original as a comparison. And yes, I 100% think that's a little messed up. It seems to me they were in a bit of a crunch with this game since they would have obviously wanted to continue to capitalize off of 2's success, and that meant adhering to a pretty short development window, which is understandable from a business perspective, but scummy if that means cutting content for the end user which I'm a bit conflicted on. Notice how I threw that qualifier in there about comparing this game to the original. You guys honestly have no idea how many arguments I've been in with people on my definition of a remake. 
To me, it means remaking the original game as it was, but thrown into a new engine with new assets that mirror the originals artistically. So many have slammed me for using this metric when I complain about how far Capcom and Squaresoft are going in altering content they're meant to be remaking. I always get responses shooting me down for expecting the same game but newer and better looking. Everyone seems to be upset with me for holding these remakes to the originals, but now that one doesn't include content that appeared in the original, suddenly everyone's on Jared's side. Now, I'm sure this goes without saying, but I am not in support of removing content from a game in order to rush it out the door. I just find it odd how quick most of these people down with the idea of reimaginings over remakes seem to pivot to pointing at the original when being mad about a change. I guess I should say hi and welcome everybody to my side of the argument. Now all that being said, I don't agree with a lot of my peers who think the game is too short because of this. I finished my first playthrough in around 5 hours, which was about the same amount of time it took me to finish the last game. Of course it has to be said that RE2 gave you two 5 hour campaigns if you count the fluff that was the B scenarios, which I don't by the way. So why does 3 feel so much more satisfying to me? I know there were whole sections, bosses, and a lot of other stuff axed, but maybe this is why 3 had so much better pacing than 2 did. Maybe due to the lessened content, or maybe due to a better eye for game design. Either way, this game felt like it lasted exactly as long as it needed to. The pace kept a forward momentum that almost never stopped, and the story was always there to kick me in the ass every time I started to get tired of my surroundings. Where the RPD in 2 had us spending a good chunk of the game in one giant area, 3 has us constantly changing areas, and the smaller main environments make for a feeling of constant progression. In 2's remake, that would come from unlocking a door to a new room in the precinct or the lab, but in 3 we're moving to a whole new area fairly often. Of course, I do have to mention that some of those scene changes just land us in reused areas from 2, but hey, that also happened in the original, and I like it in both. But stop the presses and inform the masses, Resident Evil has a soundtrack again. It was a huge gripe of mine in the last game that Capcom replaced the series' most iconic OST with a very dry, low melody that never quite sounded like a song. And in 3, that is exactly what's on offer, up until the scene introducing Nikolai. After that cutscene ended, I was treated to an amazing rendition of one of my favorite tracks from the original, and it was almost dreamlike. I didn't really know what was going on, and by the time I figured it out, I was in heaven. And to my absolute joy, the musical homages did not stop there. It's crazy how much more tension I found in this game with the addition of the old soundtrack being remixed in the background. Now don't get me wrong, the dark silence of part 2 was really nice, but this is for sure the right way to go with sound design which sadly leads me back into another common criticism. And that is the idea that this game is far too linear. And yes, it absolutely is linear, but every RE game ever made has been a linear affair. Resident Evil's 1, 2, and 3 start you off with two paths to follow, each meeting up with each other at some point. The illusion of choice was always there because the player was able to find keys and unlock doors at their discretion, but there was never more than two real options available at any one time. This remake has a very similar structure. In the starting area, you could either go straight through the donut shop, or take a right and hit up the shortcut ladder, then proceed through the next area, returning through that same donut shop. I think the smaller scale of 3's locations are giving people the impression that they're more linear than they actually are, and to be completely honest, I think a lot of people haven't played the original release of Nemesis in a long time. It seems like a lot of complaints are coming from people who aren't getting the same experience that they remember from their first playthrough, but Take it from a guy who just played through RE3 six or seven times in a row to make a video on its ports. It's a linear game. Sure you're given a choice between meeting Carlos at the newspaper office or at the restaurant, but both locations lead to the same dialogue. The same events play out, just with some new scenery. So I gotta ask you, is there a game-breaking difference between this and this? And sure, the original Nemesis would allow for choices to be made at certain events, but I have an honest question. Is the difference between climbing up from this hole or jumping down into it the reason you replayed Resident Evil 3? Or was it how much fun you had during your playthrough? Was entering the Umbrella facility from the front an entirely different experience from going in through the sewers? For all I know, that actually is the case for you, but I can tell you from my perspective, those were never a draw for me. So they're not exactly something I miss in this remake. 
That being said, I would have liked to have seen at least one alternate ending. I've always said that I would prefer a tightly woven single narrative over a messy one that has to account for several player choices made along the way, but a bad ending would have been a nice inclusion. So to wrap up this little rant, yes, there are parts of the original missing here, and that is kind of crappy, but I honestly think the experience is a much tighter and more efficiently designed affair because of it. Yes, I of course would have loved to see more content, but I'm not completely sure the developers would have been able to retain the same great pacing if that was the case. So I definitely think it's important that you formulate your own opinion there, but in my book, they made a small amount of resources feel just as plentiful as the original. But don't you worry, I do have another controversial sticking point to talk about, and you know damn well what it is. Yes, the Nemesis encounters do play out very differently from how they do in the original game, and a lot of people seem to be pretty unhappy about it. The main complaint I seem to see online is the fact that we went from a more random occurrence in the original to a scripted plan type of deal here in the remake, and I have two main points to touch on as far as that's concerned. First off, for those of you that don't know, Nemesis was always heavily scripted. Acquiring certain key items would always trigger a Nemesis spawn, and there was very little variation in where he would actually show up without a cutscene. And as a matter of fact, that variation made the game a real pain in the ass for people trying to play it like they would any other survival horror game. See, the point of these games is to conserve inventory space and maximize efficient paths to your objective, and on paper, something like Nemesis showing up would indeed force you to change your route, and sometimes that was the case, but more often than not, it meant him spawning in a hallway and blocking a door you need to go through, and that meant eating one of his punches and hoping you had a healing item on you. Which a lot of people thought was a core element of the original RE3's horror, and I have to vehemently disagree on that point. Being cheated into a one-shot death after having 20 or so minutes without saving does not improve a horror game the same way driving 15 miles on empty doesn't improve my commute to work. The horror of Resident Evil comes from its setting, the subject matter, and a combination of the story, environment, and sound design. Horror isn't an element in the gameplay. The thought of losing progress is not a mechanic, it's a result of you either playing bad or the game being designed bad. Now, difficulty is without a doubt key to a satisfying video game experience, and sometimes that means the player is going to die, but I'm less likely to want to master that difficulty if I think I died as the result of an off-screen dice roll and not my own actions. So yes, I actually really enjoyed the new scripted Nemesis encounters. But that wasn't how it was at first. See, in my first playthrough, I was actually really pissed off at how strong he was and how he could leap over your head and cut you off. But in my second playthrough, I noticed something. What I was doing was running away from Nemesis without attacking him like I was playing through a really fast run of RE3, and that was not the right way to do it. In my second playthrough, I noticed a lot of environmental hazards I wasn't taking advantage of. His first spawn outside the power station has a generator I could have shot to stun him, and that same situation showed up at nearly every spot he ever gave me trouble at. My second and third attempts at this were much more fair, and I honestly felt like any damage I took was due to my own reaction time, which is exactly how I would have liked to have seen Nemesis in the original. Of course, there are a lot of enemies that can one-hit you, and while that is annoying as hell, we're now playing a game that gives you an evasive maneuver, so at least it's fair in its annoyingness. Oh yeah, did I mention the dodge is back? Well, it is, and hot damn does it feel good to nail one of these bad boys. The game slows down to show off your dope-ass evasive roll, and hitting aim will line up a few free hits on your enemy. If you guys will remember, the dodge function's ambiguity and inconsistency were major sticking points for me with the original, and while it's much more reliable this time around, there were still these moments where I took damage after dodging at what looked like the perfect time. And I think this might have been an intentional move. It's clear a lot of effort went into revamping this maneuver without making the game a cakewalk as a result. This means there are no iframes during your dodge like you might be used to in other games. So if you didn't initiate a dodge at just the right time during an attack animation, well, you're going to take damage. You could, of course, use this to move out of range, which can work sometimes, but more often than not, the frames of recovery that comes with it will put you in a similar position to the one you just got out of. I do feel this dodge could be tweaked a bit to feel more consistent, but an improvement's an improvement, and I have to say dodging was way more fun and rewarding this time around. In my limited complaints with the last remake, I listed damage output as a big issue of mine. Getting more than 5 or 6 headshots on a zombie just to have them get back up and take another 5 or 6 while I was dealing with 3 of their friends was annoying as hell, and it seems to me that Capcom has improved on this. For most of the game, zombies went down with a lot less effort, which left me feeling way more confident going into fights, which is always good, although I still do have a few complaints. 
First off, there's this weird delay where you can down a zombie and then knife them one or two times to make sure they don't get back up, and sure enough, when you walk back over them, they're gonna grab your leg while you're trying to take out any other threats. Seems like three knife strikes are required to get a reaction on a grounded zombie, and that feels a little cheap to me. Maybe this was a move to balance the gameplay since the knife is no longer breakable, but for whatever reason, it's really frustrating at first until you figure this out. On that same front, you have to wait what feels like minutes after certain animations to do anything useful. After a dodge, either failed or successful, or being hit to the ground, there's a massive amount of frames where reloading or opening your menu simply can't be done. Now this was kind of easy to get used to, but it would be nice if I was able to heal right after taking a hit from Nemesis instead of watching Jill jump to her feet and stand still for a few seconds before I was able to get her to do anything. It also seemed like Carlos' section in the hospital had zombies taking way more damage than previously. Not sure if it was just me or his weapon, but it seemed like they were much more likely to get up some of them even falling and rising three or more times. I think this was probably due to them being crammed in small rooms with each other, so killing one and then knifing him on the ground wasn't as much of an option. Speaking of Carlos, I was thrilled his sections made it into the remake, and while I did have some complaints, it's really hard to deny the satisfaction of going full auto on a group of zombies and watching the body parts just fly off them. And contrary to my initial complaints about Nemesis, I absolutely loved his boss fights. The remake of 2 got a lot of flack for its simplistic boss encounters, and while I did enjoy them, I could definitely see where that criticism was coming from. But Capcom certainly listened in that department. Not only are you going to have to do a lot of dodging and shooting, but you're going to have to figure out little puzzle elements, like shooting mine rounds at a building to blow him off while he was running. Not going to lie, it took me a little while longer than I'm comfortable with to figure that one out. These boss fights were fun as hell for me, while still retaining that same feeling I got in the original minus all the frustration. On top of that, there's much more post-game content than 2 ever offered. After your first time beating it, you'll gain access to this endgame store where you can buy buffs and weapons to be used in your next playthrough. My first buy was one of these assault coins that raises your damage output, and I gotta say, after beating the game a second time with this thing equipped, I would recommend this be the default balance for RE3. Zombies were going down with a few less bullets, which meant I was taking way less bullshit damage. This did, of course, have the side effect of making me pretty flush with handgun ammo by the end, but oddly enough, I still came close to running out of shotgun shells a few times. I assume this could be compensated for with less healing items scattered around and maybe less ammo to be found, but either way, I would totally recommend playing the game this way, at least just to get a feel for it. Trust me, it is really, really fun. And to be honest, that would be all I had to say about gameplay, but it seems like the first person mod developed for RE2 works perfectly here in RE3, and holy hell is it really fun. It definitely makes dodging a bit more involved, but I actually kind of liked how it forced me to learn the game in a new way. If you're playing this game on PC, you have no excuse to not try this mod out. Enabling first-person mode and ditching the heads-up display makes for an experience even closer to survival horror gameplay than the base game offers, and the immersion is just next level. Try it out, trust me, it's really, really cool. So I guess we should probably start condensing this all into one thought. Yes, this game is missing a not insubstantial amount of what was in the original, and I was indeed a fan of a lot of the stuff that didn't make it into the game. Nemesis is now fully scripted, and he only shows up in very specific scenes, and I do indeed think this was a much better direction for him, or at least it fit the game we got much better. All that being said, this was an amazingly fun playthrough. The combat, backtracking, and exploration still felt great despite what was missing. I would have loved to have seen a lot more puzzles and maybe one more major area, but me wanting more of a great game isn't necessarily a downside. Thanks to either a lack of content from the original game or a better trained eye for design, the pacing and flow in this game feels rock solid. Each area ended exactly when it felt like it should have, and the constant forward momentum helped me feel like I was always making progress. The scant amount of optional backtracking that can be done didn't overstay its welcome, and I really appreciate that. I do of course understand that a lot of this has now fallen into a value-based argument though. The economy being the way it is, no one wants to waste $60 on a game, and I do 100% get that approach. And that puts me in a bit of a rough position. The value of a game is such a subjective metric, one that differs vastly from person to person, so I guess in the end that'll be up to you, but I can say that RE3 was a worthy purchase in my book. I'm currently on my fifth playthrough, and the charm hasn't worn off for me yet. I think the combination of its killer story, tight pacing, and improvements on the rewarding gameplay I love from Part 2 forms one hell of a fun video game. So if you're struggling with money at the moment, just know a game's length isn't always a determining factor in its worth. 
I mean, five hours is the baseline for a survival horror game, or at least one where content hasn't been cut out of it. But if you can't imagine a world where you're not fighting a giant worm in a graveyard, maybe wait till it goes on sale. Which brings us right along to my favorite topic of conversation, the game's presentation. Now, Capcom's RE engine is well known for being both impressively powerful and surprisingly well optimized and RE2 got my vote for the best looking modern video game I had ever seen before, so I'm not going to string you along for some type of dramatic reveal. RE3 improved on that game's graphics in almost every conceivable way, making this the most impressive looking game I have ever sat in front of. And since I went so far in depth with my review of RE2, let's talk about how this game improved on my complaints from that video. First among them being the granular look that RE2 had at 1080p. I couldn't quite put my finger on it at the time, but everything sort of looked like a dot matrix print, kind of like you could actually see the small pixels that made up everything you were looking at. Jumping into the game on console definitely solved this issue thanks to the overall softer and less complicated picture, but I wanted to see this game at max settings, and sadly the better it looked, the more obvious this issue became. And in my opinion, Capcom did an amazing job of mitigating this in 3. The same wonderful eye for artistically pleasing graphics is present here, but minus that granular speckled look. At least, mostly. It's still very much present in very fine details like hair, but bumping the image scaling up can definitely help here. Sadly, I have not found a combination of settings that totally gets rid of the issue though. I also thought that there were times when facial animations could look off in 2's remake, but oh man did they fix that issue here. I can't think of a single scene in 3 where I wasn't blown away by how convincing these animations were. It seems like the devs got much more familiar with their tech in between 2 and 3 because there seems to be more points of articulation in every moving part of 3's faces. Now, it is a little hard to quantify, but it just felt more real to me this time around. The damage you deal to enemies seems dialed back a little bit, which might seem like a bad thing, but I always felt like it looked a little off in 2. After a few headshots, I would see a lot of weird yellow or orange tones, and that doesn't really seem to be the case in 3, or at least not to as large a degree. The environments are just as stunning as they were last time around, but this time show off way more of Raccoon City. In 2, the short glimpses you got seemed to disappear into the darkness and didn't really give you a feel for how the rest of the city looked, but 3 has a much brighter color palette. This means you get a good look at your surroundings, and just like before, there are some of the best looking environments I've ever been in. Every crashed ambulance or piece of pavement wet with blood is represented with gloriously gruesome detail. And in my strangely specific, hyper-analytical opinion, the most exciting thing to talk about is that Capcom seemed to have ditched the adaptive lighting levels from Part 2, or at least that's what I call them. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, load up a game of RE2 Remake and stand in one area, then turn your camera towards a section of the room with more light than another. You can actually watch the game slowly increase or decrease the amount of gamma and brightness on the screen, and it's a relatively slow process, which always kind of irked me. Well, I'm glad to say that's no longer an issue, so congrats to the four or five people who ever cared about that. We do, however, have to talk about the main controversy that was making the rounds back when this game was announced. It seemed like a lot of people didn't like the redesigned look these characters had, but I was always kind of indifferent to them. Sure, they're not what we're used to, but they do fit the new direction Capcom seems to be taking the series in, visually speaking. I don't know, something about this modern, realistic look just does something for me. I think it works really well. And I know I'm in the minority here, but I think this is the best nemesis we've ever seen. It's kind of weird that he's got a sideways nose, yeah, but we are talking about a guy with half of his face stapled together. It's not exactly the strangest thing going on here. Plus, the new look really accentuates his animalistic nature. Every scene he shows up in makes him look like he's powered by a nuclear arsenal of just pure rage. But even though I really like the way everyone looked in pre-release media, this really just comes down to personal preference. I did, however, notice there might be some subtle changes since then. The art circulating around the web as early as a few months ago seemed to show Jill's hair looking slightly different and her face having a more squared off jawline compared to what we saw in game. Carlos also had some changes made, with his face looking a little more round and baby smooth in the early days. Regardless of their changes though, every character in this game looks absolutely stunning in my opinion. I'm not sure how they made such large strides in the engine given the short amount of time in between 2 and 3, but the difference in lighting, facial animations, and small details is just clear all around. That being said, I did notice some issues both new to this game and ones I noticed in 2. Like I said before, 3 mostly fixed the issue that 2 had with very grainy pixelated looking graphics, but you're still going to see this in fine details like hair. There's some far off shots where you're going to see this a lot and it's going to be pretty distracting, or at least it was to me. 
It does get much better with an image scale of about 150%, which makes sense as the picture is getting super sampled, but not everyone's going to be able to run the game at that high of an internal render resolution. Just like in the second remake, lighting is an absolute marvel, but you are going to see scenes that add a hazy, smoky look over what should be a much darker black. I'm not really sure why this is the case in both games, since there are plenty of spots that are lit perfectly, but every once in a while you're going to see a dark hall that's more gray than black, which is kind of annoying. <sighs> and sadly, just like last time, screen space reflections are broken across the board. The reflections caused by this effect are inconsistent and very pixelated. They may disappear when you hit angles the game can't calculate, and they add a smeary blur across every surface they're projected on. If you're playing on PC, I strongly recommend you turn this feature off right at the start. Trust me, the terrible reflections aren't worth the performance hit, and you'll still get localized light sources reflecting off the environment, so you're not going to be missing out on anything important, I promise you. Of course, it would be criminal of me not to point out the rampant reuse of RE2 assets in 3. Nearly every zombie in the game will look familiar to anyone that's escaped the RPD recently, and that's on top of it using assets that were already borrowed from RE7. These boxes, the inventory screen, and the yellow tape are third generation renders at this point. And yeah, I guess it would be necessary for a game that came out in such a short release window, but no one forced you to put this game out so soon, Capcom. I'm sure we all would have been more than happy to wait another year if it meant getting more original content. I do want to point out that this didn't really bother me too much, but this is a $60 game and there are certain expectations. And having a new cast of deadheads would have certainly made an amazing experience even better. And on top of that, it seems like there are less of the unique animations that will play when downing a zombie. 3 uses a very finite amount of these animations, and they all feel a little more pre-baked than before, which leads to zombies not interacting with the environment as realistically as they used to. And speaking of which, there's this odd issue where animations will skip what seems like most of their frames depending on how far away you are from an enemy. You won't see this too often, but this scene here with the zombies behind the fence shows it off pretty well. See how shaky the movements are? It's kind of odd, but I assume this goes towards saving precious resources, or at least that's the only thing I can think of. But even though this list of issues was pretty damn long, they are just small things I noticed, and all things considered, that does include the downsides, this is the best looking game I have ever laid my hands on, and the sheer amount of noticeable improvements over Capcom's last RE game is absolutely staggering. All of the beauty of the last game is here, but improved on and lacking in a lot of the flaws. The shiny wet look that covered everything in 2 has been dialed back and now only applies to things where it makes sense. The facial animations are several steps further than anything seen in the game, and the particle effects are even more believable. Luckily, there are the same bevy of graphical tweaks here on the PC version, and even though you don't see this as much as you'd like, a visual indicator of when you're overworking your machine's assets is always appreciated. Thank you very much for that, Capcom. And right about here is where I would compare the console version to the PC release, but this game managed to come out in a time when most places are shutting their doors in fear of a very T-virus-like outbreak, so it looks like we're going to have to wait for that level of analysis. Now, I can't personally confirm this, but based on what I've heard from the internet, base model Xbox One seemed to be showing some type of frame rate issues, which is never good. You know, this engine always impressed me, and I'm a little disappointed I can't see how well it works on my own PS4, but oh well, no use crying over missed console ports, I guess. So, presentation-wise, RE3 is absolutely gorgeous, there is no denying that. It took the incredible graphical achievements of RE2 Remake and improved on them by such a degree that I assume there was an entire console generation in between their respective releases. If you're anything like me, the focus on lighting and small details will give you a nearly infinite amount of cool effects to jewel over in every part of the game, but rest assured there's something here for everyone. The animations are still top-notch, the game looks incredibly smooth when running at above 60 frames per second, and the realistic faces slash acting is convincing to a scary degree. And you know what? I don't care what anyone thinks, Crooked Nose Nemesis is without a doubt the best nemesis. Alright, so there was a clear positive bend to this video, and there is a very good reason for that. This is an amazingly fun game. I was genuinely blown away at how engaged I was the entire time playing it, and even now on my fourth or fifth playthrough, I am still loving it. Going back and looking at other videos, there have been a few sticking points made by other critics, and I'm not saying they're wrong in criticizing the game on its length or cut content. What I am saying is RE3 is incredibly fun despite those issues. The story is a clear improvement over the original, the graphics are to die for, and the more action-heavy gameplay, while not what I would prefer in an RE game, stays very true to the source material. 
To me, it feels like the developers really understood what made Resident Evil 3 tick and brought a modernized version of that into the world with a degree of success very rarely seen in these kind of things. There's no doubt that more work could have been done to it, I'm not going to sit here and deny that, but that doesn't mean there isn't a supremely enjoyable remake to enjoy as a result. If the game's length is a major sticking point for you, keep in mind a game doesn't necessarily need to be over 10 hours to be enjoyable. I'm sitting at about 20 hours of overall playtime right now, and I have no doubt I'll get another 10 hours in by the end of the week, so in my estimate, I got my $60 worth. But of course the old hours long versus satisfaction gained argument is going to go a different way for everyone. So if you think a 5 hour game just isn't worth it right now, I totally get that. But if anything I ranted about in the video perked your ears just a little, I'd say go ahead and take the plunge. Resident Evil 3 continues Part 2's tradition of reimagining the OG RE games and implanting them into a new generation's worth of nightmares. Now of course you guys know my position, it would be all tank controls and fixed camera angles if I had my way. But the remakes coming from Capcom have proven that the original RE formula is a little more pliable than I once thought. It still works here even under a totally different framework, so I guess what I'm trying to say is I gotta get out of here so I can play more RE3, but I have some more retrospective related content in the works, so don't worry. But until then, I hope to see all of you again right here on the Resident Evil Retrospective. Hey, what's up guys? I appreciate you spending a little bit of your day with me here. If you like the video, I'll have some more entries in the retrospective linked here on screen. And if you want to support more independent content just like this, head over to my Patreon and sign up with some of the coolest people on earth. And I think that's about enough shilling out of me, so I will see all of you guys in the next one. Peace out.